rarely am I as excited as I am today to be driving a new car and let alone a new electric car but my tester today is amazing it's the BMW i7 based on the 7th generation G70 7 series so with this generation 7 series BMW decided not to offer short and long wheelbase versions of the car it offers only one variant which is 5.4 meters long and it rides on a 3.25 meter wheelbase that's half a centimeter longer than the previous version the G70 is available as a mild hybrid diesel based around BMW's latest six-cylinder diesel engine it makes around 300 horsepower then BMW also offers two plug-in hybrid versions of the car both based around its B58 six-cylinder engine and these are called the 750e and 760e at the top of the range there is also a 760i but unlike previous 60 bad bmws this one no longer has a v12 bmw gave up on that engine for this new generation of 7 series and it replaced it with a similarly powerful v8 engine interestingly what makes that car quite special is the fact that it actually has an s badged engine so the engine that will go in the next M5, where I'm sure it will produce more than the 544 horsepower that it does in the 760i. And then there's this, the i7, which has a 105 kilowatt hour battery pack with a usable capacity of 101.7 kilowatt hours. And in spite of its quite optimistic WLTP rating, the vehicle should give you a real world range of between 350 and 400-ish kilometers. That's if you don't try to drive it efficiently. But now I'm doing 115 kilometers per hour on the highway and it's hovering around 29 and the car's average is 36.8 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers to give you a rough idea and today with exactly 59 percent left in the battery the car is telling me i can drive 209 kilometers what i really like about this car's range prediction is the fact that it shows you a minimum and a maximum value which you can expect so for instance now it does say that i can do 209 kilometers but it also says that i can do 165 kilometers minimum or 350 kilometers maximum the i7 can be dc fast charged at a maximum rate of 195 kilowatts which is less than the best evs on the market that's enough to bring its state of charge from 10 to 80 percent in around 30 minutes bmw recommends that in order to extend the life of the battery you shouldn't regularly charge it over 80 percent i wonder if anything happens when i put it in efficient mode let's see no 208 165 350 so the same values i'm just going to put it back in expressive mode because i just can't get enough of these uh, artificially generated acceleration sounds made by Hans Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer, I applaud you. Your sounds are what make this quite expensive car feel like an expensive car because if this car didn't have this special sound signature by the renowned movie soundtrack composer, it would just feel more like a cheaper EV because all electric vehicles are silent. And you can make this vehicle silent, you can turn what are known as the iconic sounds off, but I really like the sound. Quite cool, I think. Powering this car is a pair of electric motors, one driving the front wheels and one driving the rear wheels. The motors are not of the permanent magnet variety. BMW calls them externally excited asynchronous electric motor. With this type of motor, the vehicle can actually make its wheels vibrate, which you can see when you enable launch control. You may not think much of this feature, but it really does make this EV more exciting. BMW also says these motors use no rare earths in the making of the rotor magnets which means their manufacturing process is more environmentally friendly than other EVs. It makes 544 horsepower and 745 newton meters of torque. That's enough to send this vehicle to 100 kilometers per hour from naught in 4.7 seconds. However, independent tests have confirmed that it is quicker than that, unsurprisingly for a BMW, obviously. 
The top speed is 240 kilometers per hour. But you can imagine that at that speed, your range is gonna plummet. The i760 xDrive model that I'm driving today is currently the only electric variant on offer. However, BMW does plan to launch an even spicier M70 variant, which will reportedly have 660 horsepower and over a thousand newton meters of torque. The car comes as standard with four corner air suspension, which does a phenomenal job of ironing out bumps. My tester has 21 inch M style aero wheels, but it is remarkably comfortable. It's up there with the S class. It might even be slightly better because Mercedes suspension, while comfortable, is a bit noisier. You hear some clunks and thumps sometimes from it and you get none of it with this car. Although this suspension setup itself isn't completely quiet. So we're now doing about 80 kilometers per hour and the car is dead quiet to be honest. Another point I appreciate about this car when it comes to comfort is the fact that even though it's electric and the huge battery pack sits beneath you, you don't feel like you're sitting especially high or your legs don't feel pushed up by the high floor. BMW says that it managed to make the battery pack itself quite slim so it's only 11 centimeters tall and even when you're sitting in the back which is where you want to be in this car you will be sitting exactly in the same place as you do in the normal 7 series which I think is an achievement although for passengers in the back there's still a transmission tunnel here so the middle passenger won't be especially comfortable and besides will you ever carry a middle passenger in the back in this car i don't think so you can just drop down the center console and you can just relax and enjoy this car's features which we'll get to once i stop and run you through the options list but now as i'm threading it around these uh, sweeping bends i'm actually driving some enjoyment from driving this car it really is good. I don't think it's any sharper than the Mercedes S-Class, although it might be. But it's definitely sure-footed and eager to accelerate and to turn. The car comes as standard with rear wheel steering, which really helps you when maneuvering in town, especially considering this car is huge and you need all the extra maneuverability that you can get. So as I said, it's 5.4 meters long and 1.95 meters wide and you really feel this on narrower roads and it might come as a shock to you because when you drive the vehicle on more open roads it does shrink around you which is remarkable because it weighs over 2.6 tons in i7 guys that's around 400 kilos more than a comparable 7 series the 760i let's see the turning circle yeah it's still not amazing, even with the rear wheel steering. Now let's do a launch. So not to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.7 seconds. You need to be in sport to access all of the 544 horsepower. Otherwise, in the other modes, the vehicle is making 490 horse. You have a boost paddle here. Launch control active, the car vibrates. That's 100. It's quick enough for this kind of car and considering how big this is. When you put the car in sport, which is what I did now, you can configure, you have all sorts of modes. Some of them are configurable, but you can stiffen up this car's suspension and it should be better through the corners. So let's see a sweeping left-hander. I like that this car really, really doesn't lean and it hides its weight so, so freaking well. It's really good. A big barge with plenty of agility. Good job, BMW. This is a remarkable car. It's very, very special to drive and be aboard of. And we haven't even gotten to the toys. But as a car, if you were to buy it with no toys, just the standard car maybe with a couple of options that don't push the price up because this car starts at 130 ish thousand euros at least in romania with the m sport pack anyway and my tester with all of the options that it has on it 
costs 193,000 euros. Is it worth that much? I'm sure. It is expensive and you need to be a millionaire to spend 200 grand on a car, but it does feel special enough to warrant that kind of money. I mean, it is a Rolls Royce-like experience from so many points of view. I mean, you do sit a little bit higher, just like you do in a Rolls Royce, and you get the feeling that you're piloting a huge ocean liner or something. It's a nice feeling, definitely. In sport mode, you don't get that much pitch and dive when you accelerate or brake more vigorously. No matter what you do, the car stays incredibly level. And this also applies when you go around corners in regard to lean. So I'm pushing it into this corner, as you can probably hear, and it does not lean. It did start to understeer a little bit, but it was all manageable. I wouldn't say this car actually likes corners, but it's not afraid of them. And it's actually kind of fun. I'm chucking a nearly 2.7 ton car around and just powering out of the corners with plenty of verve. What a cool driving experience. And even though I'm in sport mode with the suspension and its stiffer setting, and I do feel the road ever so slightly more, it's okay, I can live with it. And just cruising in this car, you really appreciate how special it is. I also like the fact that you hear the acceleration sounds even when you decelerate. So now I'm in sport mode. Which makes the whole experience feel quite natural. I really, really love driving this car. And another thing that feels natural is the brake feel. So in electric vehicles, the first part of the pedal travel is usually regen. And automakers often have trouble blending the regen with the actual physical friction brakes, which my M Sport Pack tester gets an optional set of with blue painted calipers that have four pistons up front. They do a good job of stopping this behemoth. I'm gonna do an emergency stop from 90 kilometers per hour. Oh yeah, and this handily reminded me to mention the crystal strip in the interior, which is quite expressive. It runs on the front doors and on the dash, and it is a nice design feature that also has some functionality built in. I've so far not mentioned the exterior look of the i7. It looks fine from the side. It's a nice looking 7 series. There aren't any frivolous details. It's just a well-designed, well-proportioned, big car. And because BMW didn't go for two separate wheelbase options, the rear door no longer looks like it's stretched. Both doors look like they are proportional to one another. Stretched wheelbase vehicles usually look weird in this respect, I think, with small front doors and much larger rear doors. Space in the trunk is exactly 500 liters in this car, and it does differ from variant to variant. I'm not sure which one has the most space, but there's not much in it. It's like 15, 20 liters, if I remember correctly. So, the exterior is polarizing. It has a face that only a Bavarian mother would love, to be honest. I mean, only its creators, I think, like this vehicle, although I question whether or not they really do. So the front has the new split headlight design with daytime running brows that you can have with optional embedded crystals, but I frankly am not sold on the crystals. I mean, I don't think they work on this matte black car with the M Sport Pack. I think the standard design daytime running lights do look better than these optional ones on an M Sport car. If you get a more luxury-minded vehicle with some lighter trim on the outside, then sure, I think it would work well. BMW no longer makes laser headlights, so these are full LED, matrix LED type headlights, and they work very, very well. The auto high beam function is exceptional. It lights up road signs and um, does an amazing job of not dazzling oncoming cars. My tester being an M Sport pack car also gets a more aggressive bumper in the front, which certainly works with the design and it does make the car look 
quite sporty, even though the driving experience doesn't really match this. And while most people have a problem with the front end, I also have a problem with the rear end. I just think it makes the car look too tall. There's like a bit of flat metal in between the light clusters and the bumper that just looks weird. So we've just passed an E34 parked on the right there and that's such a low and sleek looking car compared to this. I think that's probably my favorite 7 Series. This really is a taller vehicle, even the driving position. I have my seat all the way down and when I put my arm on the windowsill, as you can see, I do appear to be sitting quite low but your position in relation to the road itself is a bit higher than in older, similar Ultra Luxo barges. And the car is definitely taller. So it looks it and it feels it. And while I do like to sit as low as possible in all cars, even SUVs, I think that it actually works for this car, the higher driving position, because it makes you feel like more of a boss, to be honest, and you have a sense of owning the road and it makes you feel quite special and smug getting out of this car, to be honest. So while people might think that you have uh, size issues when you buy something this big, they should also know that you might be smug as well. <laughs> but if you drive it and are a passenger in this car, you will understand the smugness, where it's coming from. It's such an accomplished car. It's the most comfortable car I've ever driven around this road. And I've driven the S-Class around here. Well, that felt comparable. But maybe the i7's extra weight, so it's 400 kilos over the 7 series, maybe that helps with the ride quality because this just pummels imperfections into submission. It's very nice. And attacking these corners in non-sport mode, the car still doesn't lean, yet it's really, really comfy and relaxed. And I am hustling, I'm doing almost 100 kilometers per hour now. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the driving position is infinitely adjustable. It might be the most adjustable driving position I've ever experienced. So I'm sitting all the way down. I have raised the thigh support and also extended it electrically. One minus, I guess, is the fact that you cannot do that from these physical seat controls on the door. You can only move the seat itself fore and aft and adjust the, the backrest and the part that you sit on. But other than that, if you want to adjust the headrest or the thigh support, you need to go into the seat menu, which isn't the worst thing in the world, especially since you have a shortcut button here embedded in the door. There's a seat with three lines beneath it. You press on that and then it takes you to the seat menu. And then you select the area you want to adjust and you adjust it. And in removing so many buttons in this vehicle, BMW has concentrated functions into specific menus. So like this seat menu that I mentioned, but there's also a vehicle menu, which gives you um, access to all of the driving settings. And there's also a lights menu, which you can access by pressing the shortcut thing to the left of the steering wheel on the dash. And here you can adjust your light related um, settings. This is all fine and I don't have a problem with it. This car doesn't even have a physical release for the glove box. You have to do it by touching this, which granted is, is kind of premium and fancy to be honest. I don't hate it. I mean, it does work. Some reviewers have complained about the hazard warning symbol. Okay, I can see what they're on about. So you have to be gentle with it or not. Just have to press it a wee bit. Um, I think this takes too much concentration to do on the move. I can definitely see what others are on about. I do like that it lights up the entire strip here. Another detail that I like and it adds to the hyper minimalist approach that BMW was going for is the fact that this car doesn't have visible vents for the climate control. You do get blown on by the uh, aircon and all of that, but it's not clear where the air is coming from unless you take a closer look. So for instance, here, there are no vents, visible vents at least, but there's actually a slat underneath the, the crystal bar here, which is, it's plastic, but it looks good anyway. So air comes through here and you can adjust its direction with this knobbly thing underneath here and you have two of them for 
the two vents. There's also vents on the side which are disguised in a similar manner, although you cannot adjust their direction. All you can do is adjust the airflow with this slidey thing here. But I do like the design of the dash. The screen setup is the same that I saw in the i4 as well as the iX. So you get a 12.3 inch driver's display and a 14.9 inch central display, which are, in my opinion, the best on the market. I prefer them over Mercedes MBUX solution, although that is good in its own right. I'm still not a fan of iDrive 8 or Operating System 8 as BMW calls it these days, but it does have its good points. I mean, this screen is absolutely beautiful. It is very, very crisp. It has, I think, the best graphics on the market. It's not as spectacular as what you get in an EQS with a hyper screen, but I think that's just pointless and frivolous. Whereas this setup is just fit for purpose. You have the driver's display and an infotainment display, and you don't have any more pointless screens just to wow your passengers. And while the EQS is not good enough on its own, so if you get the base model with no options, it won't be that impressive. You should just get the S-Class, to be honest. But this, it really can stand on its own as a car without the toys, because it's that good. The head-up display is fantastic, it's clear, it's not too bright but not too dim. You can get it in a position where it is low enough that it doesn't intrude into your usual field of view. I mean, it does have to do that because it's a head-up display, but at the same time, it's subtly integrated, let's put it. My tester also has the Bowers and Wilkins I think it's a 40 speaker sound system. It's one of the best I've ever listened to in a car. But I don't think it's as good as the system in the S-Class, which gets 31 speakers, if I'm not mistaken. And some of them are embedded in the seat and you do feel their vibration and it adds to the acoustic experience. Oh, and I forgot that you also have a shortcut here on the door for the blinds menu. So you can do whatever you want with the blinds. You can close the roof blinds. Can you not open all of them? And also the sunroof blind. Oh, by the way, the sunroof, you see these lines running through it? Well, those are actually lit at night and they change color with the mood lighting. And it looks fantastic. It doesn't open, but it's, um, I think it's a must have option in this car. Unlike the, the TV, which we'll get to in a second, the 31 inch screen, which is the biggest single screen ever fitted to a car, ever. Because as I said, you don't need to um, spend a bunch on toys to make this car good. And I think you can skip the screen. Another thing that cannot not impress you in this car is the solidity of everything. It is really, really well put together. And I'm surprised even the door pockets, you usually can flex these in other cars. But in this, they are absolutely solid. They are lined with felt inside so that your stuff doesn't rattle around. My car has the optional cashmere seat, which I'm pretty sure are the most expensive ones you can get on this car. And for good reason. They make it so cozy and comfy. And since this is a fabric, the cooled seat function works without having to perforate the material. I also like the speaker grills. They are some of the nicest I've ever seen in any car. The cup holders have a nice lid that you can slide back and it's so damped and so pleasant to use. Yeah, this, this is a special car with a special interior and a special exterior also, but special for different reasons the exterior. Some people say they don't like the design of the dash, but I absolutely love it. I don't know what they're on about. You have this upper piece here, which actually has a fabric material on top. Here's the head-up display. You also have speakers here, or, or is, are these speakers? Hmm. Air is coming out of here. So I guess that's a climate vent. I also like this wood element here. You can get this in various finishes, but I think this works with this light colored interior. It's such a special place. I truly, truly cannot stress enough how good this feels. I think it's time for me to step into the back of the vehicle, tell you a bit more about its options and how it feels to sit in the most special seat in this vehicle. So I'm gonna pull over and show you that. Once you're in the back and you cannot be bothered to close the door yourself, there are buttons on the door that you can press and it closes itself automatically. 
my tester had the optional automatic doors. All four doors can open and close by themselves, even all at once, and they certainly make the i7 feel even fancier. They are kind of temperamental though, especially when you open them from the outside, as they always seem to behave slightly differently. They have ultrasonic sensors embedded in each of the buttons that you press, as well as in the sides of the vehicle to help it know what's around it and adjust how much the doors have to open every time. During my time with the vehicle, I actually enjoyed using the automatic doors, although they do take a bit of getting used to and the way the ultrasonic sensors are integrated isn't the most elegant looking. And once you're back here, you can start to enjoy the toys. So for instance, you have these screens on the doors that come as standard on the i7 that allow you to play with most of this car's functions. So you have Fire TV, which is the screen, which I, if I lower, you won't be able to see me, so I'll do that last. You can change the modes, the driving modes, although you can't put the car in sport because that would change the performance, I guess. You can also use your phone, display so you can adjust the 31 inch screen modes, seats, blinds and lights and the climate menu which gives you access to many functions seat heating, cooling and you can for instance enable cooling for the other seat and you can control the other seat the, the left rear seat here you adjust your own climate zone this car has a four zone climate control system as standard in the blinds menu you can go close all, which is quite spectacular, I think. Even the little ones here for the small quarter light in the rear door are electric. And this is instantly a darker place. Let's open them all again. I don't know, even this makes you feel special in this car. So you have a wireless charger which I cannot show you now because I'm recording with my phone because both of my GoPros have died. You also have hidden cup holders, which you press on this to reveal. They are nice. There's also an armrest cubby that is lined in felt and it has two USB-Cs. And it's truly a special, special place back here. You also have these nice pillows, which are also finished in the same cashmere material they are absolutely fantastic and with the executive seating pack i think you can get the lounge position which is going to take a while but it's quite a spectacular thing i guess this seat is an ottoman is that what you call it and now this is the full lounge position and you can just relax you really can. You can either heat or cool your seat. You can enable the massage and you have so many settings. I think over 10. I just like the whole body activation. I think it's the best. And finally, the 31 inch screen fold down. Please move the seats forward to ensure that the theater screen is not blocked. Now this I have a small problem with. I understand that the screen cannot come down if it hits the backrest of the front seat but maybe you should be allowed to move the driver's seat when the vehicle is stationary, just so you can lower the screen and get it in theater mode. So what you have to do is basically this. Maybe I'm wrong, but I probably am not. And once you've moved the front seat so that it allows the screen to come down, you can bring down the theater screen and it also puts up the blinds and the one in the rear as well. And once the screen is down, this is what it looks like. It gives you options to adjust the image's aspect ratio, but there's not much you can do. I mean, there's no native content for a 32 by nine aspect ratio screen. This runs Amazon Fire TV. And as you can see, it's only part touchscreen enabled. What you have to do in order to play with this is go to Fire TV, control, and then you can control it through here. So I'm gonna do what every other YouTuber has done and plug my own channel, as you do, obviously. You can also draw the letters, so you can use this touchscreen to draw them. 
just like you can in the front we're using the crystal rotary control but you can do that here as well have i pressed space i think i have let's see how quickly the predictive google search thing figures out what i'm searching for i think that if i put the r in it might know what i'm talking about yes it does hello let's see the latest content obviously some ads you can't even skip the ads. Oh, you can, you have this on screen. How the heck do you skip the ads? So this screen has an 8K resolution, which is fantastic. The car has an onboard SIM card. Boy, this sound system is really, really special. This is definitely better than what I have at home. See, can I play with the sound? So yeah, that's the screen. You can do several other things with it, like move it to a different spot to be more in your line of sight. Let me just fold the screen back up. I will say that I hit my head on this screen, which is fairly sturdily in place here. I hit my head on it twice because you just don't expect there to be something here in a car. Anyway, da da da, fire TV. How do we fold it up? Display, fold up. So yeah, that's how this works. Finally, I'm going to run you through this car's option list and then try to draw some kind of conclusion about it. So this car's exterior color is called Individual Frozen Deep Metallic. The interior is part smoke white and smoke gray merino leather. And this car has the upgraded Executive Drive Pro suspension. It also has the M Sport Pro Pack. Both of these cost around 3,700 euros each. Then there's the M Sport Pack, which adds another 7,000 euros. The automatic doors are 1,500. The Crystal Iconic Glow lights are 2,150. The Crafted Clarity interior ornaments, which are the crystally bits, that adds 871 euros. Then there's the panoramic sunroof with the embedded mood lighting. That's another 900-ish. You also have the travel and comfort pack, which is 400 euros. I'm not even sure what that is. The Bowers and Wilkins diamond sound system is almost 6,000. The interior Grand Lusso BMW interior pack is 11,000 euros. The innovation pack, which gets you the complete safety system suite in this car is 2000 the executive lounge pack which gives you this awesome ottoman seat is almost 7000 the executive pack adds 4715 euros the connoisseur pack is 2100 euros and the climate acoustic pack is 2091 euros so that's 60000 euros in options alone and while I'm not sure this vehicle is really worth almost 200 grand, this is a press fleet example, so it's very, very well specced. One with just 20,000 euros worth of options, so you get it up to 150, then I think it actually might be worth it. It's such a special car. It's better to drive than most other big electric luxury barges. I haven't driven the Lucid Air, and that's probably better. But that's not really a rival for this car, it's more of a Porsche Taycan rival, I think. And it's also smaller and lighter and uh, just not as opulent as this. And I've been aboard a Lucid and it is good, but it's not up to this level of quality, solidity and, and luxury feeling. Just talking to you for, I think it's, I've been recording for almost an hour and a half. I feel like I've only just scratched the surface. But I thank you if you've been watching all the way until the end. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this. And I'll see you in the next one.